showed up. Great. Let's proceed. Thank you. Good morning. May it please your honors. Aziz Safar for David Fim. This is the defendant's appeal from his convictions of murder in the second degree, unlawful possession of a firearm, and unlawful possession of a loaded firearm. And the case is here as a result of an allowed application for direct appellate review. And the primary issue, and the one I'd like to focus on today, is whether the Commonwealth may without violating the defendant's du double jeopardy rights, prosecute him as a joint venturer in a second trial where it failed to do so in the first that ended in a mistrial. Uh, let me first say the defendant has met his burden of presenting a satisfactory record. After I filed the amended brief, I submitted transcripts of parts of the aborted trial. These included <coughs> openings and closings, Testimony of Bunthron Che, and, and I apologize for the inconsistent name spellings in the brief. Um, they also included the uh, charge conference from the first trial, the court's charge, the declaration of a mistrial, and the testimony of Roth M. What these supplemental transcripts reveal is that there was sufficient evidence of joint venture in the first trial, but for whatever reason, the Commonwealth did not proceed on that alternative. Um, let me turn quickly just to talk about the standard of review. The defendant did not object, but had no reason to object to the declaration of the mistrial at the time it was being made. Um, and he didn't object to the request for a joint venture instruction or to the giving of it, at least as it pertained to the murder charge. Uh, but Massachusetts law on this very important claim is still not settled. So uh, the defendant raises this very important claim under the substan a substantial risk standard. And under the error tier, the argument really conflates two points. Uh, one, uh, omitting, joint venture, um, uh, omitting joint venture in the first trial really facilitated the mistrial, and two, that notwithstanding manifest necessity, uh, the Commonwealth abandoned joint venture, and uh, introducing it in the second trial was really vexatious. Um, with, with mistrials declared without the defendant's consent, of course, they had the burden to show manifest necessity, but I, I don't see how they could in this case. Um, and it may sound like contorted logic, but uh, this is more, uh, I guess it's less a matter of judicial discretion as opposed to circumventing the judge's evaluation of, of reasonable alternatives. Be because the reality is um, Judge Hines, um, couldn't have engaged in any reasonable evaluation of alternatives because, in retrospect, the Commonwealth uh, just wholly deprived her of considering joint venture as an alternative, and, and they don't offer any justification for that. In, in the first trial, there was evidence of a plan. There was concerted action. Um, the defendant had been identified at the scene, but they had a problem, and the problem was Che, one of their witnesses, had also identified the cooperating witness as the shooter. And I, I, our position is that joint venture would have allowed the jury to infer that the Commonwealth was in a sense conceding that its own witness could have been the shooter as well. And, and, all, and all this, all this is, is against this backdrop that um, this jury was at least favorable, this first jury was at least favorable to the defendant um, in that it didn't return a, a finding of guilt. Um, so his right to have that jury decide um, was need needlessly thwarted. And uh, I suggest this is the type of case that, that should be afforded the strict scrutiny that the Supreme Court talks about in Arizona versus Washington. It is, in terms of comparing this case to Choi, um, in Choi, uh, <coughs> in, the, in the first, <coughs> do you need some water? Uh, no, I'm, I'm OK. I'm running a flu. I'm sorry. <laughs> Um, uh, in Choi, the, uh, the prosecution was uh, vigorous in the first trial about keeping any evidence out that might suggest uh, 
joint venture or that, you know, that, that, that the nephew, Francis Choi's nephew, had any involvement at all in this. Um, if, if I understand this case, at least factually, as you've just said, factually there was plenty of evidence in the first trial uh, from which a joint venture instruction uh, could have been given. Is that, is that right? That, that's and, right. And that may, so my question is, is that a distinction without a difference? Um, yes and no. Um, no, if I were to only rely on Choi, but yes, because that's not the only case that we presented this um, advocation of this principle upon. Um, for example, in Saylor, uh, that court found abandonment, accomplice liability in that case, notwithstanding sufficient evidence. And, and granted, joint venture is not a separate statutory crime. It isn't even a lesser offense. But it, it, it is something that's triggered. It's a theory. I, I think it's more than just a theory, because it's, it's guilt-defining liability. It's a guilt-defining principle. But, but and in, Z in Zanetti, didn't we say that um, everybody's a principal in a joint venture? That's right, but, but I, guess, I guess what I'm suggesting is that joint venture is somewhat of an aberration of the common law because it, it's not a separate statutory offense. It's not even a lesser offense, but it is something that's triggered um, when there's the additional fact of participation by at least one other than the defendant. So while, while yeah, it's, it's not a separate crime, but it, it is something that's different enough to um, broaden the reach of, of the underlying prescribed activity. So it, it, it's a guilt-defining principle. Um, and in that sense, it's, it could be manipulated. If the, if the Commonwealth had asked for a, a joint venture instruction in the first trial and the judge refused to give it, would double jeopardy apply? I think in, in that situation, it walks a fine line as to whether it was judicial error, an instructional error, or whether the, uh, the doctrinal underpinnings of double jeopardy really are implicated to put the government in check. Um, my feeling would be yes, it would. It would because there was an opportunity there. And this is similar to what happened in, in Sailor and, and somewhat similar to what happened in Choi. Um, where the, the government acquiesces. Now, in, in your hypothetical situation, the government is actively asking for it, but the judge denies to give it. Uh, I, I, don't, I think that happens at, at uh, the Commonwealth's peril. I don't, you know, given the right that's involved, I don't see why the defendant should bear the brunt of that. That's my best answer. Well, S Saylor is very different. I mean, in, in Saylor, the state court had concluded that on the theory presented to the jury, there was insufficient evidence, insufficient evidence to support that theory. I mean, in Massachusetts, uh, you, the, well, the Commonwealth couldn't retry it now on another theory, a theory if they didn't present sufficient evidence at the first trial to support the theory that was presented to the jury. In deciding Barry, I think this- that, Barry, go ahead. I'm going, I'm, I'm yes. going back, I'll go connect ahead. the two, uh, Justice Court. All right, thank you. Um, in deciding Barry, this court was concerned with situations that would evade review, where double jeopardy principles would otherwise have forbade a retrial. Um, I'm not so sure I understand that there's a meaningful difference where there's insufficient evidence submitted and a charge with the attendant evidence not submitted at all. In either case, the jury cannot return a finding of guilt on that charge as a matter of law. But there couldn't be a retrial in Massachusetts. There could not be a retrial in Massachusetts. That, that's right. Uh, be, because the theory was not supported by the evidence, and therefore the case is over. That, the Commonwealth right. can't come back and now try it under a new theory. That's but right. here, there was sufficient evidence that your client was the, say, we'll call him the principal shooter in the case, and therefore it can go back for a trial. And why isn't joint venture Sort of a, well, a joint ventures about principal liability. Well, well the, the, principal, the principal in Sailor was more concerned with waiver, was more concerned with abandonment. And, you know, the, the, if, the, if the Commonwealth prematurely executes on its one full and fair opportunity to present, it, it should do it at its peril. And Sailor specifically stated that notwithstanding sufficient evidence in this case, we still hold the same. Um, 
and, and I, I understand I understand Massachusetts follows follows Barry, but but I think the logic of Barry is that if if we have a situation where um, the Commonwealth can hold a guilt defining alternative in reserve and constantly es escape being checked by the courts, I, I, I think that's consistent with what this court was talking about in, in Barry, notwithstanding that there was sufficient evidence in this case in both trials. You, you, you say hold a guilt-defining principle in reserve. It's taking a huge risk, though, that the jury's going to find this defendant not guilty, and then you're right where Justice Cordy is, aren't you? I'm sorry, I'm taking a risk that... Well, I mean, it may be holding it in reserve, but it's got to get a mistrial as opposed to a not guilty. Right? You're suggesting that when they held it in reserve, it inured to the defendant's benefit by, by them doing oh, it? I, I'm just suggesting that this was not an intentional action on the part of the Commonwealth because it's not going to take that risk. Well, well you know, the Saylor case addressed the, the prosecutors being asleep at the switch and talked about this slippery slope that if, if we allow this to happen, it's, it's just going to be as, as a matter of uh, uh, practice as a practical it would be it would be very difficult to know uh, what is intentional what is invidious and, and what is accidental but in, but, but in sailor it was a conspiracy theory it was issue, a conspiracy. not a joint venture theory it, it wasn't a joint venture theory that that's right and and i understand that um those are s separate crimes but as i was pointing out that it the joint venture in massachusetts is, is kind of an aberration because it oh, brought it's us the same thing as aiding and abetting in federal law Right, but it's it, again, it's it's a different. You can bring that under statute, whereas in Massachusetts, it's just it's a it's a common law principle that runs in tandem with the underlying charge. So, so, so you're saying that if you lose here, that what it means is that the Commonwealth could try somebody on, as a principal, lose, and then try him again as a joint. Of course venture? not, Your Honor. Of, so, of course not. Okay, so what's the incentive of the Commonwealth to not bring a joint venture uh, jury instruction where there is evidence that he was a joint venture. Well, I mean, there may be situations where the Commonwealth tests its facts um, on the law of the case. This may be somewhat the inverse of that. They're testing the law on their facts. Um, it, there could be inconsistencies. Now, under the old joint venture definition, they still could have brought the case. Um, you know, there, there was a plan, there was concerted action, um, there was presence at the scene. Now, now, with the new rules, with the new definition, uh, physical presence isn't actually needed and the, the standard of review, reviewing the evidence is, is more relaxed. Um, so the point is they could have brought that under the old law but did not. And in bringing it under the new definition, <coughs> excuse me, of joint venture, uh, it hurt the defendant in that his defense was that he wasn't there. And under the new principle, well, uh, you don't have to physically be present at the scene. So, so midway through this trial, after jeopardy attached, you, the, the defendant started out with what, what the definition, the controlling law was Bianco, and you know, th then retrial now enter, enters Zanetti, and he was prejudiced in that way. It impacts his defense. There are other, other scenarios where, where if, if they withhold um, joint venture, they may uh, bring in evidence under the guise of individual liability, and and it may sp speak to you know joint venture, and then they say, oh, it didn't work out this way. We have this evidence. Um, here's an extreme example, but it's not impossible. A defendant can come up and, and testify. Um, I wasn't there. I, I was in the car many blocks down the road, and then next thing you know, enter joint venture, and now, now I know it's, it's an extreme example, but now he's an accomplice. But you're not suggesting that if the Commonwealth were to identify a witness who they had not previously known about or got to cooperate for the first trial, who says, I'm prepared to tell you what really happened, and it turns out to be perhaps a little bit different from what other witnesses testified that, to. That's fine. That's fine. That, okay. That's fine. They can certainly introduce new evidence that wasn't available. And, and, if, and if what the person says is that, uh, is that Mr. Fim handed M, is it M? Uh, that's not fine. That's not that, fine. That's, so that's not so fine. then they can't use him because his, no. his, what he says really happened is, not, is now a, and, is and now it, a joint venture sound, theory. It may sound like I'm being unsympathetic, but given the right involved, if they pre prematurely uh, prosecute, their one full and fair, uh, fair opportunity to present their case, um, they do so at their own peril. I mean, there are, there are lesser, the statute of limitations, you know, notwithstanding the availability, availability or unavailability of evidence.
It's, it'll put a check on the government's power. And, and we're talking about a fundamental right here, how much more that we shouldn't give this any less weight just because, you know, they had their chance. Um, if the but, defendant but is, is so, so your argument is that any time there's a hung, trial, hung jury, then the government uh, hasn't taken full advantage of its opportunity because it didn't succeed, and therefore, I mean, isn't this? No, no. I, I'm saying, I'm saying, w once once it, it has marshaled its evidence and made a decision to prosecute, and jeopardy attaches, it is stuck with the charges that it has brought, or the alternatives that are embodied in those charges. Um, I, I see my time's expired. I, I just want to point out that a, a, as of now, there are four federal courts, including the First Circuit, that has recognized the Sailor Principle. And the Seventh Circuit, um, as well as the states mentioned in the uh, Choi dissent, have held consistent with Sailor. And we urge that this court adopt a similar principle uh, because whether it was intentional um, or, or whether the trial prosecutors were simply asleep at the switch, they certainly had the ability, they certainly had the resources to get it right the first time, and they didn't. And Mr. Fim asked this court to reverse his convictions and order the relief requested. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Good morning, Your Honors. <clears throat> Excuse me. May it please the court. Anne Pogue Donahue, Assistant District Attorney from Middlesex on behalf of the Commonwealth. Your Honors, the defendant's entire um, double jeopardy argument rests on a notion that this court has already rejected, and that is that joint venture and principle are two separate forms or theories of liability. The court rejected that notion in Zanetti and said they're not separate. They are, in fact, merely different ways of assessing an individual's liability for the crime charged. And in many cases since then, the court has reaffirmed that principle, that joint venture and, and principle are not separate theories of liability. For that reason, Your Honors, um, the defendant's arguments must fail. As to the manifest necessity, um, it is not the case that uh, that jeopardy did not attach to joint venture because it wasn't argued. Again, joint venture and principle are different ways of discussing an individual's liability. Certainly, the Commonwealth argued at the first trial that this defendant was responsible for the death of Vuthavi Fay. Because of that, yes, jeopardy attached to his individual liability for this crime. The jeopardy did not terminate because there was no verdict, either guilty or not guilty. It was a hung jury and a mistrial. And now, let me just ask you that, because I thought I read, but I could be wrong, that um, that, uh, that, that there was a, that the defendant is saying Massachusetts law is different than federal law in terms of whether a hung jury actually terminates jeopardy and you start over again. I, I'm sorry, Your Honor, I, I did not understand that to be the defendant's argument. Okay. My, I, I, my, I, I could be totally wrong. I just thought I... But my understanding is that jeopardy does not terminate um, until with a Until you actually trial, have a... Until have there's a, actually a verdict. A verdict, yes. Uh, and in response to Justice Spina's earlier question, um, on page seven of the charge conference from the first trial, it's in the supplemental record submitted by the defendant. Um, actually, the defense attorney says to the judge, Mr. M testified as a joint venturer. Of course, Mr. M, Roth M, was the joint venturer who testified pursuant to a plea agreement with the Commonwealth. Stated, Mr. M testified as a joint venturer, obviously, even though there's not a joint venture charge. And the judge says, yeah, I'm not going to confuse them with that. So it's not entirely clear what the defense attorney may have been asking for there, but if he was asking for something akin to a joint venture instruction, um, it was the defense attorney who brought that up, who brought up the fact that joint venture was an, excuse me, was an issue in the trial, even though the jury was not instructed on it. So it was not, I would suggest it was not the fault of the Commonwealth that this uh, was not presented. And there's no evidence in the record about why the Commonwealth did not seek an instruction on joint venture. We simply don't know. This, is, this case is different from Choi, where there was evidence that, uh, as was pointed out earlier, that the Commonwealth there vigorously, as Your Honor said, uh, attempted to keep out evidence that would have supported the joint venture argument. That's not what happened here. Um, also in Saylor, it's not entirely clear what, what the record was before the Sixth Circuit in Saylor, but the Saylor opinion um, says things like poor preparation of the prosecutor, the prosecutor withholding theories. 
I would suggest that that language suggests that there may have been some evidence before the court of some intentional conduct on the part of the prosecutors there, as appears to have been the case in Choi. And the record is simply devoid of any such evidence here. <clears throat> so from, for those reasons, Your Honor, I would suggest that um, the defense attorney's argument about manifest necessity fails. Uh, the case was tried as individual liability. Yes, the Commonwealth argued principle, but as the court has said, joint venture is not a separate theory. Um, the jury was hung, a mistrial was declared in the perfectly normal course of events. That is a manifest necessity if there's a mistrial. And although the defense attorney had already mentioned joint venture, he certainly didn't jump up and say, wait, Your Honor, please instruct the jury to consider joint venture so that we can try and get a verdict once and for all. That's not what happened. Instead, he agreed to the mistrial. He didn't object to the mistrial. And at the retrial, um, again, we don't know exactly what evidence in total was presented because we do not have a complete transcript of the first trial. But we do have the testimony of the two key witnesses from the retrial, and they appear to have testified consistently in both trials. <clears throat> and, and their testimony was that four guys got together, and at least two of them said, hey, let's go scare this rival gang and shoot up their house. So they all four, one of them produces a gun, they all four pile in a van, they drive over to the house. Two of them, David Fim and the cooperating witness, Roth M., get out of the van, walk up to the house, and one of them starts shooting into the house. A bullet strikes and kills 15-year-old boy inside. I would suggest that that, regardless of who's firing the shots, that is evidence that either of those two individuals could be convicted either as a principal or as a joint venturer, regardless of whose gun the hand was in at the time of the shooting. So that was the evidence. And, <clears throat> Your Honors, at, at the second trial, um, on the third volume at page 174, the Commonwealth first states its intention to the judge of seeking a joint venture instruction. The defendant does not object. On volume five, at page 122, the judge says she will give that instruction. The defendant does not object. The next day, volume six, on page six, um, the judge says again she will give that instruction. And again, the defendant does not object. Um, on volume six at pages 124 to 127, the judge does give the joint venture instruction, the instruction that this court um, propounded in Zanetti, and the defendant did not object. I would suggest that this did not come as a surprise to the defendant. He knew going into both trials that joint venture was an issue because of the nature of the factual allegations, and <clears throat> that his uh, as the defendant concedes, he did not object, so the standard of review here is substantial risk of a miscarriage of justice. Um, but certainly, Your Honors, I would suggest there is no error. The evidence supported uh, an instruction on the Zanetti instruction that more than one person was involved, including this defendant. That instruction was supported by the evidence, and it was supported below. And I would suggest to Your Honors that that is the test. As this court um, has stated in Taylor versus Commonwealth and in Fickett, the test of whether the Commonwealth can pursue a theory at a retrial is not what the Commonwealth argued at the first trial, but what the evidence supported. So certainly, yes, if the Commonwealth, for example, had tried to argue at the retrial extreme atrocity or cruelty, that likely would be unsuccessful and untenable because there was no evidence of extreme atrocity and cruelty or at the first trial. But that's because those are separate theories, and joint venture and uh, in principal liability are not separate theories, and in any event, they were supported at the first trial as well as at the second trial. Let me, let, let me, would you agree, just to, to use your example of extreme atrocity or truly, I mean, this is a crazy hypothetical, but let's say you've got these facts and then a new witness appears between <coughs> trial one and trial two who for the first time describes thing, I mean, actions that uh, the defendant took that would give rise to a, um, a th I mean, that, you know, could support a theory of extreme atrocity or cruelty. Would you say Commonwealth couldn't do that because even though it's a new evidence, a new witness that nobody knew existed until this second trial, or could the Commonwealth do that? I, Your Honor, um, it seems likely that this court would come to the conclusion that the Commonwealth could not pursue that theory because this court has ruled multiple times that the test is what theory the evidence supported at the first trial. So if there was no evidence of extreme atrocity or cruelty at the first trial, it seems likely that the Commonwealth would be barred from pursuing that theory at a retrial, even if new evidence came to light. So, so the premise of your argument then, obviously, is, as you just said, 
that joint venture and principal liability is one and the same theory. So there's nothing, nothing different about that. Well, I, I, I think I think the Commonwealth wins either way the court chooses to look at it. If if this court were to accept the defendant's theory, uh, the defendant's argument that they are separate theories, which I don't agree with. I I do believe, as this court has said, they're they're both just individual liability. Um, <clears throat> the fact the the test would still be what did the evidence support at the first trial. And here, the evidence did support both at the first trial. That goes back to my argument that the test is not what the Commonwealth argued. The test is what did the evidence support. And I would suggest that um, that the court's decision in Santos uh, supports that, where the court said that the jury does not need to be unanimous as to principal or joint venture. And also the outcome of Zanetti, where, um, where this court ruled that because um, the evidence supported a principal liability, the defendant could be retried on that theory. The test is, what did the evidence support at the first trial? I'm confused by your mentioning the failure of the defendant to object to it. Yes, if, it if it were a violation of double jeopardy, would it matter that defendants failed to object to trial? I mean, can you waive double jeopardy? Can you waive double jeopardy? Um, I, I don't know the answer to that, Your Honor. Um, I, I think the, the defendant's claim is partially a double jeopardy claim, but it is also an instructional error claim that the judge should not have given this instruction. And, and I do think that the defendant has an obligation to object. And it, certainly the defendant has an, obje has an obligation to object at the very least to what he perceives to be an, an instructional error. And I would suggest that the fact that the same defense attorney represented the defendant in both trials was aware that the joint venture issue was present from the first trial. The fact that he didn't object to that instruction, I think, sheds light on at least his view of whether it was a double jeopardy violation at that time. That's what I would suggest. Um, <clears throat> Your Honors, the, the defendant has made some arguments about due process and, and it seems general unfairness uh, because of surprise, but there was no surprise here. There was no surprise evidence. There was no surprise theory because the defense attorney was already aware of the fact that joint venture was an issue because of the factual nature of the case. Uh, and I would urge the court to consider the public policy ramifications of what the defendant is suggesting. The defendant is suggesting that uh, essentially that at least the Commonwealth, if not both sides, has to be bound by the evidence and the arguments and the instructions presented at the first trial. I would suggest that that would place the Commonwealth in an untenable position in many circumstances. Now, in, in this trial, was there a joint possession instruction given or simply a joint venture instruction given as to the firearms? <clears throat> As to the firearms, I believe that that was a joint venture. Um, so there, I, was, there, was, there was no instruction that the possession, the, the possession may, be, may be single or joint, a constructive or actual? I, I don't believe so, Your Honor, but I'm not entirely sure. I apologize. Um, <clears throat> the, certainly, the, the judge, when the judge gave the Zanetti instruction, it was I believe before she defined the elements of the different charge defenses, because later the jury returned a, a note with a question about whether um, joint venture applied to the firearms charges. And uh, at that point, the defendant did object to the judge responding to the jury that, that joint venture did apply to <coughs> the firearms charges in addition to the murder charge. <coughs> I guess the question is, when you have a firearm and the issue is possession, isn't the question whether it's joint possession as opposed to joint venture? I mean, to knowingly participate in the possession of a firearm? Isn't it really a joint possession argument as opposed to joint, joint venture argument? Well, I'm, I'm not sure, Your Honor, but we don't know what the jury was thinking. The defendant wants this court to, to conclude that because the jury asked that question that they must have concluded that it was, in fact, M, the cooperating witness who had the gun who performed the shooting. But we don't know that that's what the jury was thinking. Juries ask lots of questions. Right. Well, I think it's not, it's fruitless to attempt to decipher a jury yes. question. But, yes, but, I agree. But I guess legally, should there be a joint should there be a joint venture instruction if the issue was possession as opposed to being the issue of whether or not it was jointly possessed? If Your Honor is asking whether someone can be a joint venture in the possession of a firearm, I think the answer is yes. And certainly in this case, there, there was evidence. I believe the evidence was sufficient uh, to establish joint venture as to all of the charges, but certainly also the eyewitness, uh, Bunthorn Che, testified that he saw the gun in David Fim's hand, so there certainly was evidence that the jury could have found that uh, the defendant himself had the firearm in his possession. <clears throat>
<clears throat> so, Your Honors, I, I would suggest that um, I would suggest that Saylor is different from the facts of this case, uh, along with Rendon Alvarez, in particular because in both of those cases, the trial went to a verdict. Those defendants were found guilty. Their jeopardy terminated. Their convictions were later overturned because of insufficient evidence. I would suggest that those, um, those circumstances set those cases apart from what happened here, uh, and, and therefore that this court should not adopt. I, I also think the court should not adopt the reasoning in Saylor because um, I, my read of Saylor is that there the court is treating conspiracy and accomplice liability as separate theories, which again is not the way that this court has been treating principal and joint venture liability in Massachusetts since Zanetti, uh, which I would suggest is the correct assessment of the law and er would urge this court to continue along that path. Uh, <clears throat> Under federal law, if a jury is hung um, and the a court concludes that the evidence was insufficient to convict. Can the individual be retried? If there was, um, if there was, well, I don't know, Your Honor. <laughs> um, I, I think it depends on this, on what evidence was presented. Right. Uh, That's a trick if, question. If there were other theories. <laughs> um, I would like to draw the court's attention. There is an error in my brief on page 29. I identify John Siang as the older brother of the victim. That was a mistake. He was the older brother of the witness, Bun Thorn Che. Um, but there was testimony that uh, Siang, uh, the victim was in Siang's house at the time that he was shot, and Siang and the victim were both members of the Asian Boys Street Gang. I apologize for the error. If there are no further questions, the Commonwealth will rest on its brief and ask this court to affirm all of the defendant's convictions for the murder of Buthavi Fei. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll take a brief recess. All right.